Last time, uh, last time I saw you, you were feeding me donuts. I was feeding everyone donuts, wasn't you I? Donuts. <laughs> I had quite a few to get rid of. You had a lot. You had a mountain of yeah. donuts, and I had one of your donuts. Then I went and had a glucose check at the oh, one yeah. of the other stands Spike that for the and my glucose. <laughs> <laughs> was but yeah. uh, you were Mr. Popular that day. I was, yeah. I think we we struck gold with the donuts, definitely. You um, done that before, right? You knew, it was yeah, work. yeah, yeah. We knew it was going to work. It was uh, definitely. Um, uh, well thought out and well planned in regards yeah. to what we were going to do but um, you know everyone loves a donut everyone loves a free donut guilty pleasure yeah, yeah exactly. free guilty pleasure exactly and then you know we can say it's it's for work and then you know everyone can watch it off with their taxes I suppose <laughs> <laughs> tax free yeah. tax free donut there yeah you, you nailed it on that day yeah certainly we had a <clears> podcast <throat> a couple of weeks ago talking about exhibitions and the idea of giveaways and how you attract strangers to your stand yeah and we referenced you oh did you the donut guy <laughs> did, did, <laughs> I'm, the, the I'm donut. literally the, do, the donut guy of Shropshire yeah. um, but I'll take it yeah it, um, it, it really works well we've got a um, a great um, partnership with Planet Donut. Um, right. One of our directors uh, basically works with the director at Planet Donut, and, and that's how we kind of got our foot oh, in the door. Um, so you have constant supply of donuts, then? literally. Yeah, <laughs> like, on call, just whenever you want them. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're really good with us in, in regards to kind of the marketing and everything around it. And we've obviously got our own signature donut now, which is great. You? Uh, you know, not many people can say that. <laughs> a Duello donut. <laughs> a Duello donut. Some so. people have a coat of arms or a phrase, no, but you've no. got your own donut. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, I can imagine everybody listening now is getting very hungry, so I think we've got to start the podcast. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the SME Growth Podcast. Every week we try and put out some content that's interesting for small and medium-sized companies looking to grow. And sometimes it's just me and Richard chatting away on some subjects or other, but sometimes we're lucky enough to have a guest. So joining me this week is Nathan Blissett. Good morning, Nathan. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming into the studio. No, I was very excited to uh, have this conversation. Yeah, well, it's um, a subject we were prompted to think more about when we met you at the exhibition we were just talking about, the, the Donut Famous exhibition. Yeah. And you've got a business which, on the face of it, looks like lots of other businesses out there selling a financial product. You sell mortgages. Yeah. But your story is much more interesting than that. And I wanted to unpick a bit of that today as well, find out how you got into it and how you're finding it. And you've taken a very different approach to it as well, which we're all, we're on the office. We were looking at your website and your stuff. Oh, yeah. We love it. It's great. You, you know, the, the, the angle you've taken really sort of struck us as a, an interesting way of any business to be able to look how could they approach an existing market yeah. in a different way. I so appreciate that, yeah. But start off, give us a bit of your background because you haven't been a mortgage advisor all your life, have you? No, no. So um, I've been a mortgage advisor for the last three years. Yeah. But prior to that, I've been a professional footballer for the last 11, I would say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, playing all up and down the country, um, Kidderminster, Cambridge, Torquay, Plymouth, Bristol Rovers, <laughs> Tranmere, to name a few, uh, name I could go few. on. <laughs> well, I think you, as I say, you are our first guest on this podcast with your own Wikipedia page. There you go. So Brilliant, that yeah. marks you out, doesn't it? <laughs> so, okay, so you're a professional, fo professional footballer. Yeah. And as everybody knows, that's a great career for a period when you're young and fit. Yeah, yeah. But professional footballers tend to retire uh, what, in the 30s years, or something. Yeah, or yeah exactly. Later if you're goalie. Uh, and then you've got to think of another career. So you can't have been thinking all your life you're going to be a mortgage advisor. So how did that thought come about? Yeah, of course. So I came into football quite late. Um, you know, usually most footballers would have a YT, a youth contract through, a, you know, um, a large club, say, for instance, take uh, Shrewsbury, for instance. But I never really had that. And I went to school. My mum and dad were very much on education. I went to university, done my business degree. Um, and then I kind of stumbled into it quite Interestingly, like you could probably make a movie about it. Like, I was at the, at the park, someone was walking their dog. I was playing really well and they kind of said, you know, to come for a trial, D that kind no of way. thing. That's that how, is like, the sort of thing that happens in movies. Yeah, yeah. that's how it happened. Um, so I stumbled into football, but I always knew that, you know, it's a short career. I'm going to definitely go ahead and do it because it's something I've always wanted to do. Yeah. When I was younger, it would be a footballer or be a businessman or a pilot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had the, the, the qualifications for the pilot, but um, yeah, so... Uh, when I was a footballer, I knew that by the time I'm 32, 35, that's probably going to be my time to call it a day. Mm. Um, and what what is it that I'm going to be interested in moving forward? And football gave me the, the freedom to literally choose whatever I wanted to do moving forward as my second career. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I really just kind of had to sit down and, and look at it at the face of it and think, what interests me? 
Yeah, and what did you get advice then? Did someone suggest it to you? Fully enough, it was when I bought my first house, and then yeah. it was the mortgage advisor that that helped me buy my first house. Yeah. Was the reason I'm a mortgage advisor now. <laughs> that doesn't um, sound like they did a good job then. No, no, he did a brilliant job. That's oh, what I'm saying. See, yeah, right. he did an amazing job. His name was Will. I can't remember his last name, but me and my wife walking into uh, an estate agency, mm-hmm. not knowing anything about anything saying we want a property, you know, our first house, we want yeah. to build a family, et cetera, et cetera. And he just talked us through it all, you know, that while we were there, the aftercare, all the way through to, all the way through to completion. And mm. I left that meeting and I said to my wife, I was like, that's something I could do. I really mm. want to do something like that. Um, and that was kind of the seed that was planted. Um, fast forward maybe two to three years, uh, COVID hit. Um, and I was, what, 28, 29? And that's when I was kind of thinking to myself, right, what is it going to be? What do I want to do? And I thought, if I can just do my qualifications now, mm-hmm. while I've got the downtime, because I wasn't playing football, everyone was in their house. Yeah. Um, you know, most people playing video games and whatnot, but sure. I thought, you know, if I can just cr- crack on and, and get my qualifications done, this is my career for the next, you know, 20 to 30 years. So, and that's how it kind of happened. There's a great example, really, of how opportunities pass all of us by all the time. And having the, the luck and the courage to spot and then take advantage of those opportunities can, can define your career, really. So right from being spotted playing football in the park yeah. through to having a chance encounter with a really talented mortgage, mortgage advisor, advisor yeah, yeah. that inspired you to say, of all the things in the world, from pilot to, to anything else, yeah. I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like well, you made it your own. Yeah, like I said, he, he was amazing for us and I want to try and be as good as that. I mean, I feel like I'm, you know, hopefully I am. Um, mm. But just to give that level of kind of security and comfort to mm. people in those vulnerable positions, because it is quite vulnerable. It's one of the biggest things you're ever going to do in your life. Yeah, sure. Get married, have a kid, buy, buy your buy first house. So yeah. I want to make sure I can give that comfort and, and create that yes moment, which is yeah. kind of the ethos behind dwelling mortgages as well. Yeah, so... For a start, I'm struck by the fact that this is a highly regulated industry. Anything financial services yeah. is. So just doing the exams is merely one step of many steps that you have to take before you can be a practitioner in it. So how did you get, how do you cover all those barriers? And oh, get to, to be it? fair, actually, it's not. So really, once you've done your exams, you are allowed to to practice. Right. What well, all, all you need to do then is be uh, vetted by the FCA mm-hmm. um, under either uh, a network or if you go directly authorised yourself, which... Mm. I wouldn't advise anyone for you know starting that to yeah. do. So you've gone the network route. I've gone the network route. Yeah. So originally I started as a self-employed advisor underneath um, uh, a company called uh, AFP Shrewsbury. Mm-hmm. That's who I started out, out working for. And he, um, the, the director there, Gary Harper, he showed me the ropes of every, everything. So yeah. w- when it comes to you know the qualifications of a C, of a C map, it doesn't really um, prepare you for actually advising yeah. clients on a day to day basis. You know the mannerisms of how to contact a client, um, get an application well, it's more technical, you mean? It's yeah, a lot more technical, you know. Every single lender is different, so mm. the criteria to get an application through, you know, the relationships with, with the BDMs, all those kind of things you need to learn on the job. Yeah. Um, so that's where I started, and, and that's what you kind of need to get under your belt first and foremost to be a competent advisor, right. and that's probably the best way to describe it. You, you're an advisor straight away from um, qualifying but to become a competent advisor where, you know, the compliance side of it, every single case has to be checked yeah. until you're a competent advisor. And once you're a competent advisor, they know you know your stuff. Yeah, then you so can they can kind of leave you yeah. and, and to do your thing, so to speak. So when you set up, you clearly didn't want to just be like everyone else in the high street. You were inspired by this advisor that yeah. you'd had. So how did you set out your stall to be different to the others? What's the sort of the brand that you've built? Yeah, so the, the brand was really to be disruptors right. and that that was kind of the forefront be disruptors and be one percent better than everyone else at, mm. at everything so you know not have a usb of we are the best at this mm. but be one percent better at you know communication at tenac- tenacity to contact um, lenders to do the research just just trying to do everything one percent better and then mm. you know that that adds up and yeah. then you there's a clear um um, gap between you and the competitors. Yeah. So that's how we kind of... Um, but you strike me, when I look at your website and I see you at the comms, see you at the exhibition and so on, you, you could well be better than all the others, but unless I've been in the mortgage market recently, I wouldn't know that. Yeah. But what I can tell straight away is that the business just looks and feels different from the first time 
I encounter it even yeah. without needing a mortgage. I look at your website. So dwello.co.uk, is it? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So if anybody goes on there, have a look. Does that strike you as a mortgage company website? No, it's very, yeah. it's aimed at a more youthful market maybe. Correct. It's a one-page website, correct. unlike lots of others that are bombarding yeah. you with information. So there's something else about it, which I'm trying to get my, my head around. You know, put my finger on. <laughs> you know, what, you've set out to do something very different and you've achieved it. I'm wondering what drove that. Um, we looked at the market and we saw it was very drab, you know, it was very yeah. straight lined. It was, you know, purple, blue and black maybe. That, those mm. were the colours that we saw generically across the market. So we thought, right, if that's how the market is and that's how it's been for the last, say, 15 years, we're coming into this market selling the exact same product as everyone else. Um, how do we differentiate, differentiate, I can't even say mm. the word. Mm. How do we, um, you know, be different than everyone else in regards to being in this arena and, and trying to grab a bit of market share. Yeah. Um, we, we knew that colours play a massive part to people uh, and attracting people in, in this day and age of social media. Um, we knew that, the, you know, the the market we, we wanted to go to was kind of the age group of myself and my business partners, yeah. early 30s, um, company directors, uh, young families. Um, that way we can, we can kind of grow with them. Um, so there was, a, there was quite a few things that we kind of pinpointed that made us look into Duello being how it looks right now, which is, yeah. you know, we call it the peas and sweet corn because it's, you know, bright yellow and green. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah, it, th there was a mate, there was a lot of things that we thought about. There's a lot of thinking has gone into that. Yeah. I think you nailed it. It's great. You know, and, and everybody in the office here that's had a look at it remarked on the fact that it's, it's talking to them, you know, we've got a yeah. generally young workforce here and they felt this, this is much more for them <clears> than <throat> all of the other stuff you want. Yeah. I mean, we went to a conference um, as a group about a month ago. Mm. And uh, and that was at HLPR Network. That's mm. who we work under for our, comp our compliance. And uh, the person doing the uh, introductions basically said, anyone under the age, uh, so anyone, yeah, anyone under the age of 40 years old, raise your hands. Mm. And there was about, out of 150 people, there was about seven of us. Mm, okay. So that really pinpointed to us as well that, wow, we're, we're quite young in this um, market. Yeah. Um, and everyone else is, like I said, is very stable. They've they've got their their business that they've made for the last twenty years. They're not looking to change or redirect themselves to the new market that's coming up. But we're now in that space where we can really grab market share. Yeah, and oddly, a lot of your market is your age group. Yeah, uh, certainly the first time buyers or people wanting more hand holding through the mortgage process. They're yeah. wanting advice. Exactly. So you're um, able to talk about. Talk about that to people your age. Yeah, definitely. I mean, w once you have a mortgage advisor, for instance, yourself, you probably had one in, in the past, or you might have one now. Mm. He's your mortgage advisor. You know, yeah. he's the guy for you. And if he's done a good job for you, then you're not really going to go elsewhere. You stick with it. Yeah. yeah. So we're not really looking to go for people's clients because once you build that trust and relationship, mm. that's 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 yeah, yeah, that's the golden egg. Um, so we're really just looking to build those relationships with people coming into the market that are looking to purchase or, you know, get a bigger house for the family. Yeah. Those are the people that we're looking and for. And then keep in touch throughout. Yeah. Now, another angle you said about was around directors. Cause, uh, those of us in business and several people listening will yeah. know this arena. Most business owners, privately owned business owners, privately owned companies. Shrewd businessmen. Shrewd yeah. businessmen <laughs> and women, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And looking to, they usually pay themselves through dividends rather yeah. than salaries. Yeah. And some mortgage companies, you know, get... Because interest about that. Yeah, so is well, that a big deal or is that? It's overplayed? not. It's, that's the thing. It's not a big deal. But what I found is a lot of uh, advisory firms, again, the ones that have been stable for the last fifteen or twenty years, they've got a churn where, if they can do the easy stuff, we call it a vanilla case, where mm. it's you know, two employed individuals looking to borrow maybe two hundred grand, um, and they've got no kind of CCJs or defaults. That's the case they want, mm. which is absolutely fine. But when it comes to directors, there's a bit more legwork that you've got to mm. do in terms of an application to provide evidence that most uh, you know, established brokerages don't really want to do. Not yeah. that they can't or they, they won't. It's just not at the top of their pile as to what their so ideal they go client is. Market, turn the handle, turn yeah. it through, lowest Turn machines, possible. that's what we call them as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, where we, we, we relish on those kind of um, yeah. deals. I, I love that kind of stuff because... It, it gets it allows me to flex my muscles a little bit in yeah, terms of more. yeah do a bit more show what I can do and um, yeah. really go out there for my client and get the best for them when it comes yeah. to affordability. Well, it sounds like then you're solving a problem and what we're looking for when we buy is we want someone to solve our problems, don't we? Yeah, so you're doing that for somebody. I like to think maybe so, yeah. where they're going elsewhere and they're not getting it solved. Yeah, I mean, how I met my two business partners was literally that. 
in a nutshell. They, they're both um, in, uh, directors of their own companies. Um, one had an agricultural tie, which is no mm-hmm. one wants to deal with that. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to deal with that. Yeah. But they're both, you know, relatively young in, in the infancy of their businesses, one, two years and one year's worth of accounts. Um, and they they both paid themselves relatively modest, modestly for what they actually could. Yeah. So there was a lot of retained profit in the business. Um, so most people look at that and say, well, this is what you're taking out. We can only get you this much. Mm. But really, if you look at the retained profits, they could t- they could draw on that at any yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so really, if we can go if to the a, there yeah, as well, if we can go if we can go to a lender that's going to accept that, okay, then we, there's you know the horizon's a lot. Well, there's a range you. of lenders out there you can find. Yeah, exactly. Resources. There's a range of lenders for everything, literally anything, yeah. and there's nooks and crannies that you have to really, really research because it's not you know in plain day sight for everyone. Yeah, sure. Um, but it's the man hours. If that you, you know put the market, in. yeah, easier. yeah, exactly. Now another sort of side shoot to that, and this was interesting in our prep for today's podcast because this is an area that you don't work so much in. But I was interested in the commercial mortgage side of things as yeah. well. But also, I come across quite a few directors who are looking to raise funds from their primary residents to be able to maybe do an MBO. Yeah. Either, either, or to just refinance their existing business, but quite often it's asked for around MBO. But, you're, but you said that there's actually a, there's a rule around that. You, can't, you shouldn't yeah. really be doing that. Yeah, so most lenders don't feel comfortable when it comes to using your residential property as, you know, um, to get equity out of that mm. and put it into your business because it just throws up so many implications as to how well the business is going. If if you're trying to, you know, um, raise capital from your house, why are you doing it um, and giving it to your business? How good is the business? What's mm. wrong with the business? Where is the business going? They can't have it. They've got no real say on what you do with that money when it sure. comes to the business. So they like to keep it more in house, and you know. Well, you could remortgage on your house and go and buy a boat with it, right? You don't. They're not yeah, policing yeah. what you do with that. Money. Yeah, yeah. You and because I understand could. their con- potential concern that if you're trying to prop up a struggling business, then yeah. that's maybe not a good idea. Exactly. But if you're trying to invest to enact an MBO and therefore take an increased ownership stake, or to invest just to grow your own business, yeah, you're saying they'd still be nervous about that. It's just a whole area they'd rather avoid. Yeah, it's a whole area they'd rather you know avoid, like you said. There, there might be a few lenders out there that will go go down that route um, but from the conversations I've had with uh, BDMs in the past it's definitely something they would rather not do yeah yeah. but you've you got a network you could hunt around you may be able to find people that would be prepared to do yeah, that so it's like, just not mainstream I, I've been asked the question a few times and I've, I've now you know with the network I have I've got people that work in that space that in regards to people looking to build finance um, or secure finance, sorry, for mm. their businesses to expand it in any way. Yeah. We can go to those kind of uh, individuals and, and get the proper kind of funding instead of having it on the residential side. Yeah, okay, fair enough then. Now, the other angle that I was interested in, because you talked about this when we're having the chat at the exhibition over my donut, there, there was yeah. I looking up the second one. And you I said, you, didn't I? <laughs> you did, yeah. <laughs> not surprising. Uh, and you said that another clever angle you take is to go into businesses and offer like a free surgery to yeah. all the employees. You've got everybody there mm-hmm. in the same building. The employer allows the employees to come along, maybe it's a break time or maybe even in work time, yeah. to come and have a chat with you. And it's kind of seen by the company as being an employee benefit. We're gonna yeah. give, not going to give you, but we'll allow you access to mortgage advice while you're at work. Yeah, so it kind of benefits everyone, really. Uh, the employee gets a good rap for, you know, looking after their employees and, you know, their well-being because mm-hmm. this is a very stressful time. This year has been for, for everyone. Yeah. Cost of living, the mortgage market, interest mm-hmm. rates. Like, that's that every, yeah. you know, the, the forefront of everyone's mind. And then for the client, what I've found is even speaking to clients that, you know, have contacted me, Nine to five is very very hard for me to contact them. Yeah, they're at work. They're yeah, at work. Sure. And then you go you go from five to nine. They've got kids, family, mm. dinner, all that kind of stuff that they have to deal with. So people's times are very stretched. And then when you think about it, mortgages. Do I really want to be talking about it mm. um, at this part of the day where I've got to do you know a deadline? Or I've got to pick up the kids. Mm. So I thought to myself, well, I say I we thought to ourselves, yeah. what's the way we can you know alleviate that problem and get into get into a business and, and basically just to speak to these people on an informal basis. If they want to come over and, and have a chat, if they don't, that's absolutely fine, but we're there, so we're present. Um, and we thought, if we can get into, into somewhere that allows us to just set up shop, have a cup of tea, have a donut, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> people are going to come. A lot of donuts. Yeah, <laughs> people are going to come. So it, it's really worked well over the last, say, two months where, we, when we've piloted it. Right, okay. um, we did a big one at um, Higgs LLC um, in the West Midlands. Yeah. Um, and that went really, really well when it comes to, you know, obviously generating leads and whatnot. We've got quite a few that have, you know, 
uh, in our kind of timeline of over the next few months will be coming into fruition. So it definitely helps people get their head out of the sand because mm-hmm. a lot of people have done that yeah. in this year, which is, I understand. But With interest you know, rates doing what they've exactly. done. We'll come back to that. It's, yeah. it's, it's understandable, but you know, it's not going to solve the problem. So yeah. we, again, we're just trying to solve a little problem that uh, and alleviate a bit of stress. So but still a trial stage. You're, you've given it a go. Yeah. Early signs are positive. Yeah. Would you say that you're really going to focus on larger companies with lots of employees or would you consider across the board? It's across the board, yeah. So, you know, if there's a company with 10 to 15 and if there's a company with 150 to 300, then yeah. I'm happy to, to do yeah. all in between. And you go in on a regular basis so that they know that every month you're there on a Monday morning? So it wouldn't be a, a regular basis, but f- I'll probably do it maybe twice a year. Okay, because so people you, would be, they'd be aware you're coming. They'd be able yeah, to they'd be, yeah, up yeah, there. Yeah, so we've got like marketing material with, you know, the P's and Sweet Corn to show, do yeah. I know I come in at this time? Yeah. If you've got any queries, if you, if you want to book in ahead, you can do. Yeah. Or if not, just drop in for a donut and a chat. Well, it reminded me of uh, an exercise we did when we were working with a law firm about four or five years ago. And we did something similar. So that's why I, was, I okay. hooked onto it when you told me that you'd done it. And we got one of their partners, actually, to go into a couple of employers on a regular-ish basis, maybe every three months or so, and it was advertised, just for general legal advice. And, you know, it's amazing, like you say, how busy people are and they just don't deal with those things yeah. outside of work. Give them access to it where they are, and suddenly you, you realise there's an untapped market there you can exactly. make it easier and it's probably a general lesson for businesses anyway to think about where your market is and see if you would gain by moving closer to where they are rather than always expecting them to come to you yeah it's not always there, easy. there was one thing i always noticed um i whenever i went to the shop the, the shopping um uh establishment wherever i was yeah. there was always a little um you know the window chip people yeah oh, to, yeah, to yeah fix your window chips on the car, you've got yeah. a window chip in your car mm. oh it'll be right. we'll sort it out later yeah. But they put it in the car park. They put it in the car park. And it was, you know, the line was massive. Yeah. Because it was right there. It's convenient. It's so convenient. And and that's what one thing we kind of looked at. It's like, yeah, if you can just be convenient for people. Yeah. um, If you need something, you know, sugar, milk, whatever, Mm. you're going to go down to the local corner shop because it's right around the corner. Yeah. Even if you pay more for it. Yeah. Yeah. It might be a bit more expensive, but you're going to go there instead of going to the big Tesco or whatever. Yeah. But it's another way of you disrupting, in a way, because I think there's a perception that the mortgage industry and the advisor industry around it is is pretty established, stayed maybe, Ex- you know, a bit stuffy. Exactly. They just expect you to come to and come, see them. To now, to be fair, and, and advisors I've had in the past will use their evenings, and they, they you know, yeah. it's pretty unsociable for them, but they yeah. have to come around. You've got to do the it's hours. so much easier for them and you if you could bury that into the daytime. And another thing, again, so I go into kind of estate agencies, solicitors and um, accountants, and what I found is, wh- why are you doing this? You guys don't mm. do this anymore. It's like, mm. why wouldn't I? I mean, you're here. Why don't I come to you? And, you know, everything's yeah. done over the phone or Zoom at the moment, which is absolutely fine. It does make our life easier. But, you know, to be uh, on the cobbles, so to speak, and, mm. and, and um, getting your miles in, I, I'm more than happy to kind of do that because yeah. I know that no one else is. Well, it strikes me that you thrive a bit off that contact as well, face-to-face contact. You're, you're not yeah. someone who wants to hide behind a screen. And maybe that's part of the company's brand as well. It's personable in that way. Yeah, I like to think so, yeah. Face-to-face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, through my career, I've always been in the spotlight. I've always been looked at, you mm. know, every Saturday is performance and what are you going to do? Show me mm. something. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it comes second nature to me to, to yeah. be in front of people and have that, those conversations. Yeah, great. Well, we did say we'd come back to it. So while we're here, we better get a bit of an update on the market. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's gone crazy, of course. Interest rates have gone up uh, successively for a period of decisions due in about half an hour's time I think today yeah. from the Bank of England we're expecting it to stay stay flat but we've had month after month of successive 25 basis, basis point rises yeah. haven't we for the last couple of years now those of us that are old enough say that this just come back it's to the normal, levels they always were right? Normal, yeah. <laughs> at least it's not up <laughs> whatever figures we were used to when we were first time buyers but for anybody that's bought over the last well since the financial <clears> crash <throat> really back in you know 2008-9 yeah. this is unprecedentedly high levels Definitely. of interest rates and of course anybody having taken a mortgage out in that intervening period will have budgeted accordingly yeah, they? yeah. so where are we at now what do you think is going to happen over the next uh, year or two what's your view on fixed rates and all that sort of thing yes yeah, so, I mean in regards to the market itself yes we've been spoilt a little bit over the last say 15 16 years where the interest rates have been ridiculous mm. but for my generation that's all we knew yeah. um so when it when it comes to you know the market leveling out and correcting it's been very interesting and, and at some points a bit of a catastrophe mm. um the market itself is finally leveling out it's, we've had its peak 
well, we've had kind of two really, um, but it's over the last three months it has slowly declined, uh, week on week, sometimes day on day, and I'm talking the same lenders, just mm. cutting, cutting, cutting. And again, they're all positioning themselves to be in the right um, position to get the best market share possible, be the yeah. cheapest lender, the most uh, most applications, uh, most completions, all those kind of things. It really is a war out there at the moment for them. Really? Um, what we're seeing in terms of kind of purchases, completions, we're seeing a lot of down valuations. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the market correcting itself. Not to say that property prices that are decreasing, mm -hmm. but in regards to the valuations of properties, maybe because estate agents are, you know, inflating the prices a bit more than they right. should. Um, but those are the only things that we're seeing from the from mortgage side that is affecting applications and um, <coughs> sorry and, and completions going ahead. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's stabilising it, from what we know and what we've been told, should I say, instead mm -hmm. of what we know. Yeah. What we're predicted to see is by the end of 2024, we should be around the 4% mark, right. um, which... Again, would be, probably be the new normal. So which come is, off the peak now. Well, we're five and a quarter out at the moment, so we'll come down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we should hope to expect from mm -hmm. the lenders, anyway. And what uh, sort of longer term fixed rates are available in the market right now? So <laughs> this year, honestly, it's been so chop and change in regard to what lenders have been pushing mm. out. There was a, there was a time they they just took off everything off the market. Right. There was nothing you could lit <laughs> literally it, from about like 3,000 different products, there was nothing. Mm. Um, so you, we, there's now more of a resurgence of three year products. Usually it was two and five years. Okay. There was 10 year products, there was full term products. And, but generally again, it's going back to two and five year with some three year products available, yeah. which I think is kind of like um, the halfway house people unsure whether to fix a five yeah. or go for two. Give them a middle. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so th those are the type of products. Obviously, you've got the, your fixed rates, you've got your tracker rates, which have made a resurgence this year. Yeah, okay. Uh, tracker rates would usually only be used for landlords, portfolio landlords that were, mm. um, weren't looking to tie in and be flexible to take cash out of their properties to then invest in, in other ones. But what we're seeing is a lot of uh, residential uh, customers going for tracker rates because they want to, uh, you know, have the best of both worlds in regards to hopefully interest rates could be coming down so they'll have the a benefit each month of lower interest rates yeah. um, but if there is a spike again that they can come out of this variable rate and fix whenever they want with no early repayment charges yeah. so that's a very good product to, that'd be interesting to right um, development really from an economic point of view in the country because um, as you know the only leverage that the government or now the Bank of England have for controlling inflation is to play around with interest rates yeah. and the philosophy always used to be 20-30 years ago that if you ramped up interest rates there were enough people with mortgages that that would cut back on their spending power that would reduce demand then for inflation would come down and yeah. within 18 months your inflation is under control but over the last 20 years there's been such a predominance of fixed rates that there's been a lot of argument in economic circles that it's a waste of time giving the Bank of England this power to vary interest rates because it doesn't have a linkage anymore. It takes yeah. two or three years before somebody falls off the back of their fixed rate and sees the impact on their income. Yeah. So if it's switching back now to more tracker rates, that's an interesting reversal of that problem. And in a way, maybe the Bank of England has more power to get inflation under control. It'd be quite interesting to see how that plays out. I suppose, I mean, when it comes to the Bank of England this year, I, I don't know I don't know who's at the helm, really. Um, yeah, really yeah. Obviously, they're, they're trying to curb what, what essentially is their own doing. Mm. Um, so it's just interesting to see how they're going to do it. You know, this is the first time someone like myself has kind of lived through it. So it's, mm. it's just, I'm kind of sitting back and watching, whereas yourself, you've probably been through it uh, mm. before in 2008 and you kind of know the market yeah. a bit better. Um, but it's definitely a learning curve for uh, people in my position, uh, my age group, where we before we were told you could lend this amount mm. based off a 1% interest rate. And we're thinking, yeah, great, we can outstretch ourselves because, you know, it's yeah. Well, it's going to maybe go to 2%. <laughs> well, I hope you never get to live through those days in exactly, the early yeah. 2000s because you're getting 110% loan to values. Yeah, it was crazy. the Wild Wild West. It That's was what they called West. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, you know, we all know what happened in America, which triggered it off, but it was as bad over here. You know, there's yeah. very irresponsible lending, the way Northern Rock funded their business to pump even more mortgages out and the Royal Bank and so on. It, it, was, it was madness, really, that it was allowed to carry on. Yeah. And hopefully through all of that experience and with implementation of Basel III on the banks to increase capital requirements. It's just putting a few more safeguards in place now. Hopefully you'll never have to go through that again. Yeah. But if you do, then read up the textbooks, <laughs> the history books, because, oh my, that was, uh, that was a crazy time. And what a hangover we've all ended up with after that party. You yeah, know, It was just too much too soon. Good. Okay, that's a good update of the market then. I'm interested just to sort of close out a bit on some of your thoughts about how you market 
Duello itself, your own business? What sort of marketing do you do? Is it is it brand awareness stuff? Are you sponsoring football teams and putting posters up? Or do you do email campaigns? Are you doing social media? What sort yeah, of stuff? Yeah, so um, it's very much myself, really. I'm the forefront. I'm the poster boy of Duello. <laughs> um, getting my face here and everywhere, all yeah. over LinkedIn, all, all over Facebook. We've got a, um, a local... PR company, JMPR, they're yeah. amazingly brilliant at getting us into all the nooks and crannies of Shropshire. Yeah. Um, I call Kirsty the, the mob boss because she literally knows everyone. Yeah. Um, no, we know JMPR. Yeah, we're yeah. Good yeah. Good so they're, they're amazing for us uh, in, yeah. in regards to getting us, you know, in newspapers, uh, you know, places like this. Uh, I've, we've, we've done a few articles for the Financial Times, for Mortgage Solutions. So we've really been out there and just getting the message out as to Duello and myself. And is that working for you then? You're getting a good return from it, that sort of It really is, yeah. Mm, and it's really one of those things that, you know, it takes a bit of time. So th- we're talking maybe, when do we start with JMPR? In end of May, June this year. Oh, this year? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And um, we saw slowly but steadily the increase in, in notoriety of myself and Duello <laughs> to, um, you know, three months down the line, we're really starting to see it come back to us um, you know there's a lot more inbound than outbound so to speak Perfect. which is which is great really for me well. yeah. yeah yeah brilliant and do you drive traffic to your website at all do you pay for ads or anything like that or? so this is something that we were looking at in, t- in terms of the website in website 2.0 that's how we're looking at it um, which we want to kind of get drawn down by the start of next year mm. um, the SEO kind of thing and all the dark arts we call it mm. we 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 know about it but mm. we obviously we're not professionals and and we need to bring someone in to do that for us and that's what we're kind of looking to to build over the next couple of months you know um the festive period is quite a, a downtime for most businesses so yeah. we're going to kind of use that to rebuild what we we think we need and then um you know come again in 2024 with a kind of refreshed revitalized version yeah okay brilliant well that's a good little tour then of everything from how you got into the business how you've made it different how you drive it and we've even had a bit of a commentary on the mortgage market today yeah <laughs> a little plug there as well so anybody listening go and check out to Co UK and see what you think see what you think of their branding <laughs> dellomortgages.com dellomortgages.com there you go <laughs> better get the right URL dellomortgages.com excellent well thank you very much Nathan thanks for coming no worries, in David. so that's uh, another episode of the SME Growth Podcast every week we try and come up with something different and interesting to talk about to business owners of small to medium sized enterprises as we say every week please follow us on the various podcast platforms that uh, you may get your podcast from and click the little bell so you get told when the next episode is dropped and more importantly like we say just tell your friends about us drop them an email mention it in the pub let them know that there's some interesting content going out and maybe they want to tap into it as well in the meantime though good luck with your business 